Hey, thanks for tuning to this episode of the Tax Smart REI podcast. We're excited to announce our new show, The State of the Market, a monthly show that is exclusive to YouTube. If you want to catch future episodes of this show, be sure to subscribe to our Tax Smart Real Estate Investors YouTube channel by following the link in the show notes below or simply searching for Tax Smart Real Estate Investors on YouTube. In this first episode, we're joined with Jay Scott, seasoned real estate investor and known as one of the most analytical minds in the real estate community and an expert on economics. He's also author of Recession Proof Investing, a book focused on economic cycles and how they impact real estate. Very timely. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. In this episode, Jay breaks down the state of the economy and how we got there. We also discuss how it will impact the real estate industry today, as well as over the next one to three years. And most importantly, how you can position yourself for success and a lot more. We do want to let you know that we did officially release the short-term rental tax course, which teaches you everything you need to know about the short-term rental loophole to save five to six figures in taxes. In the course, I cover an overview of the short-term rental loophole and its powerful tax benefits, how to materially participate in your short-term rentals to reduce taxes on your W-2 and other active income, how to maximize your tax savings using cost segregation studies and bonus depreciation, as well as how to avoid critical mistakes that can cost you thousands of dollars in tax savings. By the end of the course, you will know exactly what you need to do to use the short-term rental loophole to save five to six figures in taxes. With the amount of value that is included in this course and the potential tax savings, I could have easily charged upwards of $997 or perhaps even $1,500 for this course. But you know what? Because I want to help as many people use the short-term rental loophole as possible, I'm giving it away for only $247. This is really next to nothing if you think about the potential tax savings that you can get from using a short-term rental loophole. And with bonus depreciation phasing out over the next few years, the sooner you can take advantage of the short-term rental loophole, the more tax you'll be able to save. So if you're ready to save five to six figures in taxes by using the short-term rental loophole, you can enroll in the course today by going to courses.taxsmartinvestors.com and enrolling. It's just that simple. Again, that's courses.taxsmartinvestors.com. And without further ado, we're going to jump right into today's episode after a quick word from Landlord Studio. If you're a do-it-yourself landlord managing rental properties, Landlord Studio is made for you. The software helps landlords simplify income and expense tracking. With their easy-to-use app, you can digitize receipts, record income and expenses in real time, generate reports, and even manage leases and tenants. Plus, Landlord Studio makes late rental payments and bank visits a problem of the past with secure online rent collection. Get the rent paid directly to your bank account, and you can even automate rent reminder emails and late payment fees. Landlord Studio is also the best way to stay tax compliant. They offer a range of financial reports, including Schedule E and supplier expense reports designed for tax time. You can learn more about Landlord Studio and start your 14-day free trial at landlordstudio.com slash CPA and use the coupon code REALESTATECPA at checkout to get 25% off your plan. Again, that's landlordstudio.com slash CPA and use the code REALESTATECPA to get 25% off your plan today. Hey, Jay, it's an honor to have you on the show today as the first guest on the first episode of the State of the Market YouTube show. Uh, Would you be able to give our our audience just a brief overview of your background, how you got involved in real estate? Yeah, absolutely. And first, I just want to thank you guys for having me. It's an honor to, uh, to be the first guest. So I am a tech and business guy by education. I spent most of my career in the tech industry and got my MBA a bunch of years ago, kind of did the business side of stuff, got into real estate after I left the tech industry in 2008. Since then, flipped to several hundred houses, uh, then moved into kind of large multifamily. We now own about 1,200 units, mostly in Texas, but uh, around the Southeast. And so I've, I'm kind of, I've done a lot in the residential real estate world, but what I keep coming back to, again, both from an education standpoint and just a, an interest standpoint, is I've always been really deep into the, the macroeconomics and macroeconomic cycles related to real estate and how they affect us on a day-to-day level. Awesome. Awesome. So, you know, kind of speaking of economics, I know you're, you're big on that. Would you kind of be able to give us like a quick breakdown of where we are today in the economy and kind of how did we get here? How did we arrive at this point today? Yeah. So... Well, I guess it depends on where today is. We're recording this in middle of July of 2022, and we're about two weeks away from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics basically announcing whether Q2 economic output, what we call GDP, is going to be positive for last quarter or negative. And the reason why this is so important is because if on July, I think it's the 28th, 
they come out and they say, Q2, we saw negative economic growth. Technically, that means we're in a recession because they already said for Q1, we saw negative economic growth. And by government definition, two quarters in a row of negative economic growth is a recession. Now, why is this important? Because, I mean, they can say we're in a recession, doesn't necessarily change anything, does it? Well, it actually does. What we've seen time and again is that economic patterns, especially recessionary economic patterns, are largely driven by sentiment, consumer sentiment. And when people hear we're in a recession, not only does it tell them that things are different, but it also drives them to start acting differently. So if on July 28th, the government comes out and says, hey, negative growth in Q2, and now we're officially in a recession, what that means is a lot of people are going to start acting differently from a financial perspective. They're going to start spending money differently. They're going to spend less money. They're going to save more money. They're going to be worried about their jobs. So they're going to be hunting for new jobs. They're probably going to be buying less money on credit. They're probably going to be trying to reduce their debt. All of these things have a negative impact on the economy. Anytime somebody saves money instead of spending money, it's good for them personally, but it's bad for the economy. And so when the aggregate of the country hears that we're in a recession and everybody starts spending less money and saving more money and taking out less credit, what happens is our economy slows down even more. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if it's declared that we're in a recession, I think it's likely what we'll see is some sort of snowball and things are likely to get worse. If on July 28th, and I don't think this is going to happen, but if on July 28th, the Fed says everything was great in Q2, positive growth. Well, now we're at least six months away from a recession, technically, because again, it takes two months. And so that clock would start over again in Q3. So I suspect that by the end of July, we're going to officially declare a recession. We're going to see some snowball effects just because consumer sentiment is going to be in the toilet. But if we get a good report late late July, we're probably in a holding pattern for another six months. So taking all that into account, what does this mean for real estate? And specifically, because I'm selfish and I have multifamily real estate, what does it mean for multifamily real estate? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, that's, that's the important question here. I mean, so I'm going to step back a little bit because I know probably a lot of your listeners are younger. I know a lot of people in this industry are younger. Um, I'm an old guy. You guys are young, but I'm an old guy. And so I don't just remember 2008 recession. I remember 2001 and I sort of remember the early 90s and the late 80s. But for a typical person in this industry who's, let's say, 25 or 30 years old, 2008 was 14 years ago. They were probably 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old in 2008. That was a formative event for them. They really remember 2008 and everything that happened. If you think back to the recession before 2008, which was 2001, they were probably in their single digits. They don't really remember that. So the only thing a lot of people in this industry remember when they hear the word recession is 2008. So it's natural for a lot of people to think 2008 is what a recession typically looks like. But here's the thing. That's not what a recession typically looks like. If you look at the recession before 2001, you look at the one before that early 90s, you look at the one that I, there were two back in the early 80s and then in the mid 70s, all of these recessions while they impacted the economy negatively, it hurt jobs, it hurt wages, it hurt businesses, it wasn't good for the economy, for the most part, didn't have a big effect on real estate. Here's why. One, certainly when people lose their jobs and, and their wages are going down, that's going to make it harder to make your mortgage payments. But from an investment standpoint, when people see the stock market going down, when they see other asset classes going down, what they do is they move their money over to real estate because it tends to be somewhat of a hedge. It tends to be somewhat counter cyclical to the more common investments. And so real estate has tended to stay relatively strong through many of the recessions that we've seen in this country's history. 2008 was a special event. 2008 wasn't, we saw a recession and that destroyed real estate. It was actually just the opposite. 2008 was, there were some major foundational problems in real estate and that drove the 2008 recession. And while it was absolutely horrendously bad for real estate, it was the first time that's happened in this country's history. No other recession in this country's history was driven by real estate that poorly. In 1989, you could argue there was this thing called the savings and loan crisis, which had some real estate thing, but that wasn't that bad. 2008 was a real estate crisis that drove a recession. Generally, what we see is a recession that might have somewhat of an impact on real estate. And so that's what I see happening here. I think if we end up being in a recession over the next six or 12 months, which I think is very likely, we're going to see higher unemployment. We're going to see businesses suffer. We're going to see people suffer. 
but I don't think real estate is going to take the kind of hit that a lot of people are worried about. We're not going to see a 2008 type event because for the most part, the foundations of real estate, the core metrics with real estate are still relatively strong. That's good to hear. You know, when you hear the word recession, people just tend to get, you know, scared. So I guess if we look at the next one to three years, and I know real estate's local, everybody, everybody's listening, everybody's in different markets throughout the United States. But from a macro perspective, you know, how do you think the next one to three years is going to play out for real estate? Sure. Uh, so let me let me go back to the when people hear the word recession, it scares them. Again, I think a lot of that is because what we saw, we, there was a recession in 2008. We didn't have another one until early 2020, which was kind of a blip. I mean, it, it was over so quickly. So most people don't really know what a typical recession is. You have to think back to 2001 to really know what a typical recession is. But let's look at some data. In the course of the last 150 years, we've had 34 recessions. So you do the quick math, 150, 160 years divided by 34 that's about every five years. Every five years throughout this country's history, we have a recession. You tell that to somebody who's 25 or 30 years old, and they don't believe you. It's like, what are you talking about? We haven't had a recession in 15 years. But the last 15 years have been an anomaly. For the most part, every five years, every five, six, seven years throughout this country's history, we have a recession. And it's one of those events that as you get older, you get used to them. Again, not fun. It's not good for businesses. It's not good for people. But it's not this 2008 type event. It is a, you have six, 12, maybe if you're really unlucky, 18 months worth of businesses suffer and unemployment goes up and it's harder to get credit and things aren't fun, but it's really, it's not that horrendous experience that we saw in 2008. So I want to start with that. So when you hear the word recession, don't necessarily be frightened or frightful. Um, Not saying this one couldn't be a 2008 type of event, but I don't think it will be. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, where do I see one to three years? Well, let's look at the data again. Over the last 60 years, we've seen 10 times this cycle where we start to see inflation. The government doesn't like inflation. And so what they do when they start to see inflation is they raise interest rates. And raising interest rates does two things. It encourages people to save money because higher interest rates means higher returns on your savings account. And two, it means people spend less money because higher interest rates means cost more to put things on a credit card or to buy a house or to buy a car because loan payments are higher. So by raising interest rates, we encourage people to save, we discourage people from spending, and that hurts the economy. The economy slows down. And all 10 times in the last 60 years when we've seen inflation and the government has started raising interest rates, all 10 times have led to a recession. And typically, it's within 12 to 18 months of the beginning of the cycle of raising rates that we see a recession. Well, we started raising rates, I guess it was February, March of this year, and it's possible we're going to see a recession within, again, a couple of weeks from now. So it probably happened a lot more quickly this time. But here's the other thing that we've seen in all 10 of those cycles. Within 18 months of the recession starting, the government says, we don't want to be in a recession. So they do, they, they kind of roll back the, these rate hikes and they drop rates. And that does just the opposite. It encourages people to spend and it discourages them from saving. And so when people start spending again and the economy gets back on track. So 10 times in the last 60 years, we've seen this, this cycle of rates going up, recession, rates going down, economy improving. And the typical timeline for that is 12 months between rates going up and the recession starting and 12 to 18 months between the recession starting and rates going back down. So if history is any indicator, we should expect to see rates start to go down probably within the next 12 months. And in the next 24 months, we'll probably see rates back somewhere close to where they were five months ago, six months ago. So I wouldn't be surprised if the two to three year forecast is everything is back on track. Can I guarantee that? Absolutely not. Could other things, I mean, there's a war in in Russia and Ukraine. There's certainly issues with the national debt. There's political turmoil, lots of other stuff that could kind of derail a recovery. But all things being equal, I think there's a reasonable chance that within three years, we're right back on track. We're going to take a quick break to hear a word from Relay. If you invest in real estate and manage properties, then you need banking that's truly built for your business. With all the bank accounts you have to manage for your properties, account minimums, overdraft fees, and issues connecting to accounting software like QBO or Landlord Studio, things can get extremely complex. 
This is why I recommend Relay. Relay is an online banking and money management platform that is perfect for real estate businesses. First, there are no accounting fees, no overdraft fees, no minimum balances, which means you get to keep more money in your pocket. And Relay goes beyond just the basics of banking to help you understand precisely what you're earning, spending, and saving. You can get up to 20 checking accounts to organize and allocate income for things like day-to-day -day expenses, investments, or taxes. And if you have multiple properties set up with multiple business entities, Relay lets you open unlimited accounts and access everything from one single login. Best of all, Relay makes bookkeeping speedy by giving you extra detailed transaction data and directly syncing back to accounting softwares like QuickBooks Online and Xero. It only takes 10 minutes to apply for a free Relay account and you can do that online by going to www.relayfi.com. Again, it's www.relayfi.com. That's relayfi.com. Go ahead and check that out. But right now we're going to get right back into today's episode. What would happen if the government did not intervene? Like what, what would happen if the government didn't raise rates and then didn't cut rates? Well, if you, if you want to know what would happen, you can go back to prior to the 1915, 16, 17, before you implemented the Federal Reserve. Because really, it was the Federal Reserve that was implemented in, in the late teens, early 20s, who was tasked with this idea of controlling the economy by ensuring we didn't have too high inflation and we had maximum employment. That's kind of their two charters. And they do that by playing with interest rates. So if you want to know what would happen, basically you have to go back before 1920. And typically what we saw was the same thing we're seeing now. We saw economy goes up, economy goes down. Now, typically what we saw was the economy going up and down. The period was a little bit longer and a little bit less steep. So it was kind of this more like a really narrow sine wave. And a lot of people would argue that that was much better than what we're seeing today. And hmm. there's a whole lot of people out there that would argue we don't need the Federal Reserve. We don't want the Federal Reserve. Basically, that's what broke the system in the first place. There's a whole lot of other discussion that goes along with that. The Federal Reserve also has the separate lever that they can pull to control things in the economy, and that's printing money or, or tightening up on the money supply. And you can argue that that's actually, from a long-term perspective, a more important role for the Federal Reserve. Because while we can argue that debt is bad, and for the most part, debt is bad, there are times in our country's history where being able to print money and create debt has been super important. You think back to, to World War II. Had we been on just the gold standard in World War II and we didn't have the ability to print money, we wouldn't have been able to afford to fight in World War II. I mean, most of the money to fight in World War II came from deficit spending and printing money. And so the ability to print money basically allowed us to win World War II. So there, there are times when having the Federal Reserve and printing money and, and running deficits is actually good. But I do agree with those that say that the Federal Reserve is a little bit heavy handed and, and they play with interest rates a little bit too much and they play with the money supply a little bit too much. So, yeah, there, there, there's good and bad. So I guess the idea of the Federal Reserve was to kind of smooth out the lows, I guess. Yes, to smooth out both the lows and the highs. And the um, highs. Unfortunately, the Federal Reserve is run by people and people are fallible. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like that oversteering. If you, if you get into a, a skid in the snow and you try and overcorrect, nothing really happens at first. But then once you get some traction on the ice, you go too far in the other direction. Yep. And that's kind of what the Federal Reserve does. They, they want something quickly, so they'll raise rates quickly because they think they need to course correct quickly. And what they find is once those rate hikes take hold and the economy starts to slow down, they realize they've overcorrected. So now they overcorrect in the other direction. And, and it's just, it's people with short-term thinking that don't always make the best decisions. If the Federal Reserve can look at all this data historically, why do they seemingly continue to make the same mistakes? Wow, if I had the answer to that question, <laughs> I, no, I, I don't know the answer. And, and keep in mind, the Federal Reserve, again, is trying to do the right thing. Some people would argue that they're not, but I would argue that they are. And sometimes, I mean, so I, I get the question a lot, why are we seeing inflation now with this printing of, of six, seven, eight, nine trillion dollars? But back in 2008, we printed six, seven, eight trillion dollars back then, and we didn't see inflation. Inflation's been at 2%. I mean, inflation's actually been historically low over the past decade, even though back in 2008, we printed a ridiculous amount of money. So what was different in 2008 than here in 2021 and 2022? And the answer there is we saw a, 
we saw a bad crisis in 2008. Everybody agrees 2008 was, was a bad time. But the potential crisis in 2020 with COVID was much, much worse, potentially. So 2008, when the Federal Reserve said, OK, we need to spur on the economy and we need to print money and we need to deficit spend and we need to release all this stimulus into the economy, the way they did it was they took all this money, they printed it, they handed it to the banks, and they said to the banks, go make more loans. Loan money to businesses, loan money to big businesses, small businesses, loan money to consumers, make more house loans, make more car loans. And all this money kind of trickled out into the economy. And when you have more money in the economy and people can buy more stuff, the economy starts to do better. So 2008, yeah, we printed four, five, six, seven, eight trillion dollars, but that trickled out into the economy. And actually, a lot of that money never made it into the economy. It sat in the bank's reserves because the bank couldn't loan money quickly enough to spend $8 trillion. 2020 comes along and literally with COVID, the economy fell off a cliff. I mean, people couldn't leave their houses. Businesses were shutting down. Uh, we couldn't import. We couldn't export. I mean, it looked like we were heading towards like the largest global catastrophe in the history of the world back in 2020. So what the Fed did was they said, again, we need to print trillions of dollars. But this time they said, we can't give it to the banks and wait for them to start making loans. Nobody can even go into the banks to get loans because they're locked in their house. So instead of trickling this money into the economy, we need to find a more efficient way to get the money into the economy. And so what did they do? They started handing it out. They started doing PPP and EIDL loans, which was basically handing free money to businesses. I mean, everybody remembers the stimulus checks we got for $1,200 or $1,400 plus extra money for kids. I mean, literally, they were sending money to every person in this country, which instead of the money trickling into the economy through a bank and a lot of it sitting in the bank's reserves, now went directly into the heart of the economy. People could spend it on food and clothes and luxury. And I guess nobody was traveling, but people were saving a ridiculous amount of money. And then as soon as the economy opened up, they started traveling again and buying luxury items and buying all kinds of stuff. And so unlike in 2008, where the money trickled in, in 2020, the money flooded the economy. And that's why we didn't see a lot of inflation after 2008, but we did see a lot of inflation now after 2020 and 2021. But that goes to your question of, could the Fed have done something differently? They could have, but back in 2020, when COVID hit, their first thought was, this could literally be the end of our economy if we don't do something. People are going to die because they can't eat and they can't pay their rent. And so they took drastic measures. Unfortunately, mm. those drastic measures had repercussions. But at the time, the calculus they did was, is it worth it to risk those future repercussions to ensure that people weren't dying and our economy wasn't going to collapse? And they made the decision. And ultimately, I think it was the right decision. But again, they didn't course correct fast enough. They ended up continuing to release stimulus even after the economy had started to recover. They didn't raise interest rates soon enough. And so, yeah, uh, again, it was a, yeah, they were trying to do the right thing, it seems, but they, they didn't necessarily do it the best way they could have. If we, if we do dive into a recession here, I mean, arguably we're already in one, but Two weeks from now, if it's confirmed, we are in a recession. Do you see the Fed jumping on this and trying to very quickly course correct, or do you see them just letting it kind of play out? So we have some we have an, an interesting dynamic now. So typically, and again, this is historically speaking, a recession quashes inflation. Inflation is generally driven by people spending too much money and there being too much demand and businesses not being able to keep up with the demand. And so they raise their prices because they can, because everybody wants to spend money and they're willing to pay more. Um, so historically, when we go into a recession, inflation naturally drops. So the question is, will we see the same thing this time? If we're in a recession, if, if a recession is declared and over the next couple of months, are we going to see inflation drop from, they just announced June inflationary numbers were at like 9.1% year over year. That's like either an all-time high or the highest it's been in, in 40 years. What's going to happen with inflation? Hopefully, the recession will kind of cure inflation. Hopefully, what we'll see is, is less demand. And we're already seeing, I mean, even with the 9.1 number, if you look at each of the categories of inflation, every category of inflation was actually lower in June, which I think was a result of the interest rate hikes, except for two categories, energy and food. Energy and food went up so much that it negated the fact that everything else went down. 
So in a way, the 9.1 number is a little bit misleading, and I think inflation is actually headed in the right direction. If you look at the details, inflation is headed in the right direction. Maybe not fast enough, but in the right direction. I think if we see ourselves in a recession over the next few months, I think we're going to see oil prices drop, or at least the price of crude oil drop. So I think energy, that bucket of inflation is going to be taken care of as well. The last bucket is food, and I can see food prices skyrocketing for a while. So long story short, the hope is that if we fall into a recession, inflation kind of fixes itself. If inflation fixes itself, then the Fed can feel more comfortable taking measures to try and curb the recession. Um, get this, they, they refer to it as a soft landing. Basically, they start to lower interest rates again, so we don't go into this really bad recession. And so the hope is that inflation takes care of itself over the next few months. The Fed can then start lowering rates and kind of get us out of this short, hopefully, recessionary period. The risk is that even with the recession, we don't see inflation come down. And the reason that might be the case is things are still broken since COVID. So two things that cause a recession. I mentioned the, the demand. People have lots of money. They spend lots of money. They're willing to spend lots of money. And so the price of stuff goes up. But the other side of inflation is when supply is constrained, when businesses don't have enough stuff to sell and they can't sell everything that people are demanding. And we saw a lot of that after COVID because supply chains were messed up. It was hard to get raw materials, shipping supply lines were all messed up. And so literally getting stuff from China or whatever country over to the US was slowed down. Businesses like are scared to spend a lot of money since COVID. So they're not buying a lot of inventory. They're not hiring a lot of people. They're not building warehouses. They're not buying equipment. Basically, they're just they're being cautious. And all that is kind of constraining supply. And so that's the other side of inflation. And so we can't really fix that, especially if we go into a recession. Businesses aren't going to start spending lots of money to increase supply if we're in a recession. So there is this risk that a recession isn't necessarily going to help inflation enough. And then the Fed's going to have to make a really, really tough choice. They're going to have to decide, going into a recession, do they need to get inflation down so bad that they're willing to keep raising interest rates, which will make the recession that much worse? Because the other alternative is they kind of sit around and don't do anything. And then we have a recession with high interest rates and high unemployment. And that leads to something called stagflation, which is basically where things are really expensive and everybody is losing their jobs. And that's a whole other discussion. So long story short, one of two things is going to happen. Inflation is going to go down over the next few months, in which case the Federal Reserve is likely to start lowering interest rates probably in the next year, or inflation is going to stay high, in which case the Federal Reserve is likely to hike interest rates even more to get inflation down, which is going to make the recession much worse and probably much longer lasting. Okay, that was awesome. And, uh, <laughs> and now I'm a little scared. So now I'm going to ask this next question. <laughs> What does the average real estate investor do with this information? All right, I'm hearing, I'm hearing that it could go a bunch of different ways. How do I protect myself? And, and maybe, maybe you can just kind of talk about what you're doing with your own portfolio, how your investment strategies are changing and, and what you're kind of doing to protect yourself. Yeah, and this is kind of the only question that matters, right? What, what do we do about it? Let's go back to something I said earlier, which is um, if history is any indicator, we should see things improving in the next three years. We're going to see interest rates go up. We're going to get into a recession. We're going to see interest rates go down and we're going to get out of that recession. And time period should be two to three years historically. So let's say three years, everything's going to be on track again. What do we want to be doing today? We want to be buying investments that can pay for themselves for at least three years where we don't have to be able to refinance them and get credit and, and loans against them for at least three years and that we're not too concerned about getting in, in such a bad financial situation that we lose those assets in the next three years. Basically, we want to buy stuff that has at least a three-year time horizon. Let's be safe and say, okay, this could be a bad recession, and we're actually four years out from things getting better, or five years out. So what you want to be doing right now is buying those assets that you're comfortable holding for at least five years, getting loans against them that have at least a five-year term, and being conservative enough in your underwriting that if you have occupancy that, that decreases or market rents that go down a little bit, that you still have enough cushion that you're not going to be forced to sell them for any reason in the next five years. 
And this is the reason I love multifamily real estate. When you buy multifamily real estate, typically the goal is to hold it for at least several years. I do this thing called value add multifamily, which is where we buy multifamily, we fix it up, and then we sell it generally about three to five years down the road. I'm comfortable buying today because my business plan isn't to sell for another three to five years anyway. And I expect that in three to five years, the economy is going to be somewhat, if not fully recovered. So anybody out there that's looking to buy real estate, go in with the plan that you're going to hold it for at least three, four, five years, get loans that have at least three, four, five years in length, and be conservative enough so that if your occupancy goes down a little bit or your market rents go down a little bit, you can kind of eat that lower income, that lower cash flow. If you do those three things, I think you're going to find in three to five years, most of us are going to come out pretty solid on the other side. That's awesome to hear. So no one should be necessarily just stopping and halting their investments. They just need to just keep these things in mind, you know, three to five year hold, make sure they're locking in, you know, debt with at least a five year term and uh, just being more conservative with their underwriting, make sure they don't have to come out of pocket for that debt. They can pay their debt service and they'll be all right. Yeah. I mean, this is what I'm telling people. Don't be flipping houses right now unless you're a professional. And even if you're a professional, I, I've flipped over 400 houses and I don't like flipping houses right now. When the market's going down, you don't want to be flipping houses. And whether it's going down or not, we can argue, but it's not going up anymore, at least not right now. Um, so I, I don't recommend most people flip houses. If you have any debt that's coming due in the next year or two, I know you may not like the fact that interest rates are higher, but in a year or two, not only could interest rates be a little bit higher, but it could be a lot harder to refinance. So even if you have a debt with a, a 3% interest rate, if it's coming due a year from now, I'd rather refinance at 6% than wait a year and just hope interest rates come down and it's still easy to re refinance. So refinance now. If you don't have great credit, focus on rebuilding and, and shoring up your credit right now. Because let me tell you something, the one thing that we found through each of the, the last several recessions, and anybody that lived through 2008 certainly knows this, it can be really tough to get loans during a downturn. Credit really tightens up. So if you want to be buying when there are some potentially good opportunities a year from now, you need to have good credit. So work on your credit. I also tell people, increase your credit lines. So I'm not saying use that money. Don't go and, and increase your, your credit card limit from $10,000 to $20,000 and take out $10,000, but have it available because it's a nice cushion. If you find yourself in a really bad situation, that cushion may, may be helpful. Likewise, if you have a lot of equity in your, in your private, in your personal residence, go get a HELOC. Don't take the money out, but have the credit available because if a great opportunity comes along or worst case, some negative thing happens that you just really need some help, a short-term cushion, having that extra credit will help. And then I tell people, if you have a, an investment that you're thinking, I don't want to hold this for at least three, four or five years, sell it now. Because it may not be the best time to sell. It may not be as good as it was six months ago to sell, but it may be better than it is six months from now. And so if I know I'm going to sell something in the next few years, I'd rather sell it now than just hold on to it and hope that a year or two or three from now is, is a lot better time. So just a few things to think about. This has been fantastic. Uh, this is like an amazing. I have to go back and replay this episode for sure. Just make sure to absorb everything that's in here. Is there anything else that we should know or anything else real estate investors in general should know about what's going on today? Or have we covered, have we covered about all of it? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's the, the bulk of it. I mean, I would just remind everybody that, yeah, during a recession, things tend to seem better than they are during good times and worse than they are during bad times. And I know a lot of people sit around and say, I can't wait for the next recession because I'm going to buy up everything in sight. And then we get into the recession and they're like, oh my God, I'm terrified to buy anything. And so it's really hard to keep an objective perspective when you're in the middle of it. And so what I would remind people is things are rarely ever as good as they seem or as bad as they seem. And so if we get into a recession, the natural reaction is going to be to hunker down and not buy anything. But what I would say is keep an open mind and remind yourself that things probably aren't as bad as they seem and they will recover. I remember back in 2008, 9, 10, all these investors who were like terrified to buy because... They're like, this, we're never going to recover. This is the end of the world. And then we get to 2011 and 12, and they look back and they said, oh my God, I missed the greatest opp buying opportunity in the history of this country for real estate. And I'm not saying this is going to be the greatest opportunity, but there will be opportunities. So don't let pessimistic or optimistic thinking get in the way of, of being realistic and, and taking advantage of opportunities. 
Awesome. Awesome. So I think we're, we're, we're coming up to the end right now. You know, how can investors learn more about you and everything that you have going on? Like, what do you have going on right now? And how could investors learn more? Yeah. So um, like I said, we, we do syndicated deals. We work with uh, passive investors who are looking to place money in large multifamily. So if anybody's looking to invest, feel free to reach out to me. Or if you just want to get in touch with me about anything else, or you want to learn more about uh, what I'm doing or, or what I've done, you can go to www.connectwithjscott.com and that'll kind of link out to everything I'm doing. And always happy if anybody has any questions, shoot me an email, always happy to, uh, to chat and to answer questions. Thank you again for coming on. It's been an awesome episode and thanks again. Thank you guys.